Frank Heider is a well-known, renowned visual artist. When he started to become an artist, he thought the journey would be a straightforward progression. Over the years, he has discovered that the road has many twists and turns, numerous hills and valleys, and countless challenges. Through this series of short stories, tales, and remembrances, his hope is that these will offer some valuable insight into the life of an artist and what's involved in becoming an artist. In the end, he has come to realize that he is not a painter, or sculptor, or anything in particular. He is more simply a creative person, with great passion and love for the process of making art concerning people and the world around us, who shares his artworks with the public. Join us now as we listen to another episode of A Life in Art series. As a student in art school, I went to school every morning and I stayed in school until the school closed late at night. Frequently, I would just go to a classroom where somebody was, they were drawing and painting and I'd just walk into the room and start working. And nine times out of 10, the teacher would come over and look at what I was doing and say, uh, if you want, I'll put you on the roster for the class if you wanna keep coming back. And I, that was happening and to the point where uh, I was getting credit in an enormous number of classes, uh, which I wasn't paying for. Uh, I was learning and I was really enjoying my experience, but I wasn't paying for those classes. Uh, the way art school worked was you paid your tuition and then uh, you got a certain number of classes. But Art students are traditionally very, very weak academic students. And as a result, they would be taking in a given semester, sometimes taking an academic class for the second or the third time. So uh, the art school was very lenient about the number of credits that you were taking. They weren't checking on you because they found that uh, usually students were taking up credits they needed so they could graduate. Well, I didn't really have any trouble with the academic classes, but I sure was taking advantage of not being questioned about signing up for a course and paying for it. I just was taking classes. And it dawned on me and it occurred to me that uh, uh, if I added up all the credit hours, I was, uh, I was way ahead of uh, time in terms of when I could graduate. So I decided to uh, think about what was I going to do next. And the word was, uh, um, you know, you want to go to graduate studies and learn, you know, take it to a higher level. Well, that was all good to hear. And, and then uh, there was a woman who lived next door to me in my, uh, my, on my block, uh, uh, who was a graduate student with Grace Hardigan at the Maryland Institute. And one day I was carrying one of my paintings in the back door and she stopped me and said, oh, can I look at that painting? And I said, sure. So I showed her my painting and she said, do you have any other paintings? And I said, sure. And I brought about three or four more out and I showed them to her. And she said, you know, there's this guy in Philadelphia who... I used to model for, and she said, boy, you, you have so much in your work that I know he could have a lot to say to you. And I said, well, well, who, who is that? And she said, his name is uh, Neil Welliver. Do you know him? And I said, no, I don't. But she, I said, you say you, there's really something there that he's going to connect with. Well, she said, I'm certain of that. So anyway, I found out that he was the head of the graduate program at the University of Pennsylvania. So I decided to apply to the graduate program. I wasn't really going to graduate that year, but I applied to graduate program anyway. And uh, lo and behold, I, I applied to that program and I applied to the Tyler, which was also in Philadelphia. And uh, I got a letter from Tyler telling me that I, I wasn't accepted to their graduate program in Philadelphia, but I could go to their graduate program in Italy, in Rome. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I got a letter from the University of Pennsylvania telling me that Neil Welliver was willing to accept me in the graduate program. So I went back to the school and I said to uh, uh, a couple of my teachers that I had been accepted at the University of Pennsylvania program. And now I had to sort of get the Maryland Institute to agree to give me a, a degree. So anyway, uh, I... 
I went through a, a, a quite a lot of uh, conversations with the president of the Institute, who on one level sincerely thought that it, I was too young. Maybe I was pushing too, too fast and too hard. And he said, you know, he said, there's a learning is a process and it takes time to acquire things. And, uh, I didn't want to hear about that. I was certain I, I wanted to move on to, I wanted to work with this guy who had so much to offer me. So anyway, um, we went round and round and round, and finally, uh, he begrudgingly agreed that he they would get give me my degree, even though he wasn't crazy about it. And then uh, the summer came, and uh, uh, I the fall I was at the University of Pennsylvania for the first day, and we had a big meeting about twenty students in the graduate program. And the first time I got to see Welliver, he came into the room and. He was Welliver is physically a short person, uh, not a big guy, and uh, he has a big personality. And when he walks into a room, everybody in the room knows he's there. So anyway, he he gave us a, a kind of a short description of what he expected from us. And then at a certain point towards the end of his talk, he glanced over at me and he said, you. And I said, yes. He said, you're from Baltimore, right? And I said, yeah. And I knew he didn't. I, I couldn't understand how he would know that. And he said, I want to talk to you afterwards. So everybody left the room and he walks over and he said, um, uh, I hear you're you're quite a hot dog. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, just what I said. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I came here to study with you. And he said, uh, and what do you plan to do? I said, I plan to paint. I'm here to learn to paint. And he said, well, um, if you do that, you'll get along fine. But he said, if you don't do that, I'm going to throw you the hell out the window. You won't last very long if, you don't, if you're not uh, delivering. And I said, I understand. So I went back to my studio and uh, the semester went on. And I did pretty well with him and with some of the other teachers. And finally, in the second semester... He uh, comes into my studio one day and he said, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm pretty impressed with what you've done this year. And he said, and uh, I have a scholarship to the Skowhegan program. And he said, um, I, you're my pick. I'm going to give it to you. And uh, you get to go to Skowhegan. And I said, I don't even know what Skowhegan is. He says, well, it's, it's a good thing and you'll get a lot out of it. So I called Alex Katz, who was my most famous ever teacher at the time. He was my teacher and uh, not quite as famous as he is today. I called him and I, I said something about, you know, I, that uh, Neil had told me I could go to Skowhegan. And Alex said, well, that's great. He said, that's the best place to go. And I said, well, but it's only a half scholarship and, uh, and it's another $700 for the rest of it. And he said, well, he said, look, here's what you do. You send them a letter and you say, I have a half scholarship, but I won't come unless you give me a full scholarship and send them your slides, which I did. And then about a month later, I get a letter back from Skowhegan saying, we'll give you all the money. You're welcome to come. So I went. So when I got up there, I was amazed by the the amount of talent that was there. I had never been to a place with so much talent. Now, I've already been through the Maryland Institute, which was full of talented people. I already had gone, I'd been in graduate school for a year, which was full of talented people. But the Skowhegan School was on another level. And while at the Skowhegan School, I made friends with this uh, guy who was that at that time a senior at the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. And he was very, very bright, and he was very talented, and he could really could draw, and it, it very well read. And uh, we hit it off really well. He had come from Morristown, New Jersey, and uh, we had a little shared history knowing South Jersey the way we did. And uh, so um, we decided that uh, we were going to form our own little uh, ideal group. And again, as I've, I've said in earlier uh, interviews, that... Uh, in art school, you want to stand out. You have to have a personality. You have to be somebody who's not like everybody else, somebody who has something to offer that no one else has. So uh, uh, I had come up with this idea after going to a lecture 
where we watched a lecture about uh, how this group of figure painters after World War II in New York had formed a group called Portraits Incorporated. And it was just a name, but it was an association of people who painted uh, portraits. And it included some very famous people like Alice Neal and many others, but it was just a, a like an association. So anyway, I came up with the idea, well, uh, because we're in Maine and this landscape, all of my life, all I've ever wanted to do was to paint the figure, but up painting the figure in the woods of Maine didn't seem to make as much sense as trying to figure out how to paint landscape. So I said, let's, let's figure out how to paint this landscape and let's form our own group and we're going to be called Sunsets Incorporated. Now, of course, that's a bit of a joke and, and was meant to be a little sarcastic, but at the same time, it gave us an identity. So Jim and I, every day, that's what we did. We went out every morning, we carried our paint boxes. Uh, both of us had French easel boxes and we'd carry those and we'd stand and we'd, we'd work on our paintings. We do two in the morning, we do two in the afternoon. And as we get better and better and more and more ambitious, we're trying different sites and different places to paint. So anyway, we're standing on a hill between a pond at the bottom of the hill and a, a big barn up at the top of the hill where there was a figure painting class going on. And so we're standing there and we're painting. And I noticed the director of the school walking down below with a woman and a man and they're walking around. And that was not too uncommon because the school was a famous place and we'd have visits from Marlena Dietrich and Betty Davis and all kinds of interesting people would come there. And uh, anyway, they they wandered up the hill. And after a while, I noticed they were standing behind us and as we were painting. And then the director, whose name was Bill Cummings, comes down and said hello to me. And he said, I want to introduce you to my, my friends here. And as I turned and he said, this is uh, Miss Kitty Carlisle. And this man is Sir Wilford Hyde White, a British actor. Well, of course, I knew who Kitty Carlisle was because I had seen uh, What's My Line on television for many years, and uh, there she was right in front of me. What I didn't realize that she was the director of uh, the New York uh, Association for the Foundation for the Arts at the time. And uh, so anyway, they're standing there, and they're looking at my painting, and Bill says to me, he says, Miss um, Carlisle would like to know if you're willing to sell that painting. And I said, uh, of course I'm willing to sell the painting. And, and, I, and he said, well, she wants to know how much you want for the painting. And I said, well, how much should I want for the painting, Bill? And Bill said, he says, how about $80? And I said, okay, Bill, I, how about $80? So with that, uh, Miss Carlisle looks at me and she says, yeah, I'll take that painting. And she instructed Sir Wilfer, uh, Wilf Hyde White to reach into his pocket and he brought out four twenty bills, four twenty dollar bills, and handed them to me. And uh, then I turned around and handed them the painting, and they walked away. I never saw the painting again, but it was a really great experience. So my friend Jim and I, we said, you know, let, we're getting this. This is starting to work. You know, we're getting some attention here. So we both stretched up big canvases, and we made a big plan. We were going to really do some big painting. So I had a six foot square canvas and I set it up right near these, this little wooden house that was actually bathrooms, male, male and female outdoor bathrooms there. And we were right next to a pond and I wanted to paint the surface of the pond. A very, at the time I was really interested in very minimal, kind of very gentle color changes. And Big Jim was, who was six foot four, but he was had this huge canvas about seven or eight feet long and about five feet tall. And he set it up on the other side of a picket fence. And he was going to paint me painting the pond and the little house and all that stuff. So we got started and uh, we would paint all morning. Then we would leave our stuff there and we would wa walk a mile to the lunchroom. We'd have our lunch. We'd turn around and we'd walk back and we'd go back on our paintings. Well, on the second day of painting, we get back and Jim noticed that some stuff had been disturbed in his paint area. And uh, paint tubes were knocked on the ground and some of them had been opened. 
And uh, he asked me if I knew anything about it. And I said, well, I've been with you the whole time. How could I know anything about it? So anyway, the next day we came back and his paint had been disturbed much more so. And his brushes were all on the ground and some of his paint tubes were missing completely. And uh, so now he's, you know, getting a little more angry. And he started accusing people as they walked by of maybe fooling with his stuff. And they, everybody was basically saying, look, Jim, uh, nobody's bothering your stuff. You're crazy. So anyway, we go again. We come back the next day. And now his he had a big glass piece of glass that he was using for a pallet. That was laying on the ground and broken. And, uh, his, and his painting had all these scratches on the bottom of it, all along the edges. So I... Now he's really furious, and he's accusing people, like hollering at people, threatening people. So we come back, we go the next day, we come back, and as we get back, we see what was going on from a distance. All around his painting area, there are sheep. And when we get close, we can see that the sheep have red and yellow faces because they've been eating his paint and his painting, and they've got all this paint all over their faces. So... Uh, they couldn't get to my stuff, which was on the other side of the fence. So he jumps over the fence and he's kicking sheep. I'm watching them sail through the air and he's hollering and throwing stuff at the sheep. And anyway, uh, everybody in the, when they realized this, what had been happening, it was kind of a big point of joke and fun. And uh, so the next day we had a big art critic coming up from New York who was going to give us a critique. So I carry my painting down. He carries his painting down. And his painting has these scratches from where the sheep are chewing on his on his canvas. And uh, so anyway, we're, we go through the critique. And every critique involved every student having something talked about. So there was about 55 students. So that meant it was going to be a long day. So anyway, we finally get to... Jim's painting and the uh, and the New York critic is looking at the painting and he says well this is a big painting he said but really the most exciting part of this painting are these scratches that you've put at the bottom of the canvas and everyone in the room started to roar with laughter because they had been put there by the sheep and he was furious and he he stomped out of the room slammed the door of the barn and ran out of the room and he was we could hear him cursing as he went off into the distance and the laughter in the room just it was it was an endless uh, roar of an echo as one person person after the other had had so much fun that the sheep had kind of made the show. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or suggestions for future episodes, please reach out to Frank Heider on Facebook or Instagram. We hope to see you at one of the next A Life in Art episodes. <laughs>